Um, good morning, everybody. Um, this is the first talk I've given in person in a really long time. Uh, it's good to be back um, in, a, in a real live in-person meeting again. So as uh, Peter said, I'm one of the main developers of the land ice component of, of CESM. Oh, okay, got it. So what I'd like to do is first to, uh, give you a brief background to uh, why people are concerned about ice sheets and, and sea level rise, and then talk about the way we've implemented ice sheets so far in CESM, and then give a summary of uh, CESM contributions to uh, CMIP-6 and the recent um, IPCC report AR-6, and then finally give you a summary of some work that's been done recently or is ongoing and uh, what we'd like to do in the future as we uh, work on work towards CESM-3. And this work is the that I'll be showing is the combination of the work of a lot of people in the Land Ice Working Group, um, some of whom are, are listed here. So uh, <clears throat> uh, everybody's aware that sea level is rising. Um, sea level has been rising um, uh, since the um, steadily since the early 20th century with significant acceleration toward the late 20th century. So since sea level has been measured by satellites since the early 1990s, uh, the rate of sea level rise has been upwards of three millimeters per year and is now about 3.7 millimeters per year <clears throat> with um, three primary causes. Uh, one is the uh, ocean thermal expansion. Ocean, uh, ocean water gets warmer, as, I mean, gets less dense as it gets warmer. Um, second, there's been ice loss from nearly all the mountain glaciers of the world. And finally, in recent years, since about the 1990s, there's been a significant sea level contribution from the two ice sheets, um, Greenland and Antarctica. And uh, currently, if you look at the contributions from each um, ocean thermal expansion, mountain glaciers, and ice sheets, each accounts for about a third or roughly a millimeter per year of the observed sea level rise. And if you, just to put this in perspective, uh, one millimeter of sea level rise um, may not sound like a lot, but it represents about um, 360 billion tons of ice. And one billion tons of ice is, if you can imagine, is an ice cube that's one kilometer on each side. So if you think of an ice cube that's one kilometer on each side, that's roughly how much water ice sheets are adding to the ocean um, on a typical day. Uh, sea level, uh, I, I've uh, given the numbers for global mean sea level rise, but sea level rise uh, varies a lot um, over time and over space. Um, for different reasons. Locally, you may have land subsidence that, that contributes to sea level rise. Some places are still rebounding from the last uh, glacial period, which tends to uh, contribute to sea level fall. Um, also, as an ice sheet loses mass, <clears throat> it's less massive and therefore has less gravity. And so one of the uh, sort of counterintuitive effects of sea level change is that if you look at the pictures on the left, uh, the red regions are where sea level is actually falling because the ice sheets in those regions are no longer tugging on the surrounding ocean as much as they were. And, and that's actually a negative effect on, on sea level rise that models are, most models don't yet take into account. Um, so if you look at sea level rise in the US, uh, because of changes in ocean dynamics and other things, as, as well as the isostatic rebound, um, sea level rise tends to be higher on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast um, than it is on the Pacific Coast. Uh, so the Earth today, of course, has two major ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. The Greenland ice sheet, if you um, were to take all the ice in Greenland and put it in the ocean, it would raise global sea level by about seven meters. And in Greenland, uh, before climate change, uh, the, um, well, most of the mass that arrives in Greenland, of course, is by snowfall, and, and mass is lost by two major mechanisms, which were roughly equal um, before the climate started to warm. One was surface melting in the summer in the warmer parts of Greenland, especially on the, on the western slope um, in lower elevation regions. And then the other is calving of icebergs from outlet glaciers that flow through fjords into the sea. Um, and those processes were in balance until about the 1990s, now are out of balance, primarily because of increased summertime melting and meltwater flowing into the ocean. And over the last uh, couple of decades, Greenland's been losing mass at a rate of about 230 gigatons per year on average, with some years that have extreme melt events, um, including perhaps this, the year we're in right now. 
uh, having greater greater mass loss. Um, most of the world's uh, fresh water um, in the form of ice is locked up in the Antarctic ice sheet, which contains about 58 meters of sea level equivalent. Um, most of the Antarctic continent, including the East Antarctic ice sheet um, on the, the right-hand part of the, of the picture, uh, is very high and very cold and not considered vulnerable to global warming of a few degrees or you know, anything in the, in the foreseeable future. Um, however, the West Antarctic ice sheet or waste in the left-hand part of the picture, um, the majority of, of waste is grounded below sea level, um, meaning that the marine grounded ice that forms waste um, and parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet as well is vulnerable to ocean warming. Because if you have warm ocean water, even one or two degrees above freezing, it gets underneath the ice shelves that, that ring the ice sheet. Uh, you have the possibility of uh, removing the ice shelves, thus reducing the buttressing that they provide to the grounded ice and having more grounded ice flow into the ocean. And it's the grounded ice that contributes to sea level rise. Um, this has been happening in recent years, uh, primarily in the Amundsen Sea embayment, which is more or less where that red arrow is pointing. Uh, you may have read in the papers about the Pine Island Thwaites glaciers, which are losing mass. And Antarctica is losing mass currently by about 130 gigatons per year. So if you add the two ice sheets together, you get about 360 or, or about one millimeter of, of sea level rise um, each year. Uh, then the other main contribution of land ice to sea level rise comes from the rest of the world's glaciers. Uh, the map in the upper right uh, shows circles corresponding to each of the major glacier regions as they're classified in, in something called the Randolph Glacier Inventory, which is an inventory that came out um, uh, 10 or 15 years ago of all of the Earth's roughly 200,000 glaciers and what their outlines were, their extent um, uh, around the year 2000 or 2005, which is taken as a baseline. Um, since then, most of the world's glaciers have been in retreat. Um, most of the mass is in the high Arctic, um, Canada, Greenland, Russian islands, um, and in the perif periphery of the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, and then outside the poles of uh, the place with the places with the most glacier ice uh, would be high mountain Asia um, in the Himalayas and, and nearby ranges. Uh, if you add up all that mass, it only amounts to about 40 centimeters of sea level rise. So much less than in the major ice sheets. But since that ice is melting relatively quickly, uh, the glacier contribution to sea level rises um, today is, is comparable to that of ice sheets. And in most of the world's uh, glaciers, are currently threatened and many of them could go away under in this century under warming of uh, well either under even if there were no additional warming many of those glaciers are, are, are threatened and more will go away if warming continues up till up to one and a half or two degrees so a little bit about glacier dynamics um, glaciers of course don't move very quickly compared to other parts of the climate system uh, uh, but they have two main mechanisms of moving under gravity. Uh, one is it, if a glacier is frozen to the bed, um, a glacier can be described as a fluid and it deforms slowly under its own weight and can flow at rates of a few meters to a few ten, tens of meters per year by, by internal def, deformation with the greatest speeds being at the top of the glacier and the lowest speeds being at the bed of the glacier. Uh, but then in places where, the glacier, where glaciers have been relatively relatively quickly, and relatively quickly for a glacier would be anywhere from a few hundred meters to a few kilometers per year. Um, that's the case when the bed is lubricated, when there's water at the bed, or when the uh, soil beneath the glacier is water saturated and, and weak. Um, and if you have a glacier sliding, um, then you can have speeds of above a, um, a kilometer per year. And the big glaciers that are losing mass, that's, that's definitely the case. Um, if you have ice that's uh, slow moving at the bed and deforming mainly in, in the interior under its own weight, then it's described very accurately by a set of equations called the shallow ice approximation. And if you have the opposite situation where you have no friction at the bed to hold the ice and, and the entire ice sheet is moving or ice shelf is moving like a plug with no vertical shear, then that's very well described by something called the shallow shelf approximation. Um, and, and both those approximations are fairly straightforward to solve um, mathematically on a computer. Uh, but the more general set of equations is called the Stokes approximation, 
uh, where you have all kinds of internal stresses causing the movement. <clears throat> and those equations are much more difficult and expensive to solve. And as a compromise, we typically use what are called high order approximations where we start with the more complete Stokes equations and remove some terms that make the equations harder to solve and are left with something that's more computationally tractable, but still include both the shallow ice approximation and the shallow shelf approximation as endpoints um, in the appropriate parts of the ice sheet. So in the community ice sheet model, SISM, um, that's the approach we usually take for, for production runs. Uh, and then uh, ice sheets, as I said, are losing mass currently. Um, it's important to keep in mind that, that a melt event on an ice sheet like Greenland um, is not in itself an indication that cl the climate's warming uh, because there were melt events in Greenland before climate change. But what we're seeing now is more frequent and, and much more intense melt events such that the system's out of balance, such that the snowfall that comes in annually is less than the mass that's lost um, in, Gre uh, in Greenland in the summer to, to surface melting. So you typically would have a balance between snowfall coming in and uh, ice flowing into the ocean and either melting and having meltwater runoff uh, near the coast or the ice actually flows into the ocean and eventually calves off um, from an ice shelf. Uh, this is a plot you may have seen uh, showing over the last 400,000 years based on ice core evidence how carbon dioxide and global mean temperature and sea level have changed simultaneously. And you can see that they're uh, very well correlated with each other uh, with sea level ranging by about 120 meters between the cold glacier periods and the warm interglacial periods. Um, the most recent glacial period ended about 20,000 years ago um, after the, following the last glacial maximum. And that was followed over the next 10,000 years or so by about 100 meters of sea level rise as the big Northern Hemisphere ice sheet collapsed. And there may have, uh, there may have been some additional retreat in, in Antarctica followed by some rebound, but, it's, um, but, but that's something people are still, still debating about. Um, at any rate, uh, CO2 and, and temperature were co-evolving uh, for uh, most of history before fossil fuels started being added to the atmosphere. Now, of course, carbon dioxide is driving things and we can expect that the CO2 of 400 parts per million, which is unprecedented in, in more than a million years, is going to drive some additional sea level rise. And of course, the question is how much. Uh, so to tr partly answer that question, we look to past warm periods. Uh, the most recent interglacial called the last or Eemian interglacial uh, peaked around 125,000 years ago. Um, the earth was on average was uh, maybe one, probably no more than two degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial temperatures. And carbon dioxide was around 280 parts per million. And evidence suggests that global sea level was somewhere between six and nine meters higher than it is today. Uh, so where did that six to nine meters come from? Uh, we know that part of it came from Greenland, uh, but we also know from paleo evidence that the entire Greenland ice sheet didn't grow away, didn't go away during the last interglacial. Um, maybe two or, or at most about four meters of sea level equivalent. So that suggests that to fill out the budget, you need a sea level contribution from Antarctica as well. And that most likely came from the more vulnerable West Antarctic ice sheet. So we know that both Greenland and WACE are vulnerable to sustain warming of, of, of something in the neighborhood of one to two degrees, which is where we are now and, and heading into in the next few decades. Um, the last period with CO2 comparable to today's levels of around 400 ppm was the Pliocene <clears throat> about two to three million years ago. Um, and there the paleo records are much less certain in terms of what the total sea level rise was with estimating estimates varying anywhere from about five to 20 meters. Um, it, um, at the high end, you need a contribution not just from Greenland and, and West Antarctica, but also East Antarctica. And if East Antarctica too is vulnerable to to uh, CO2 of 400 ppm, um, that's obviously very worrying. So another area of active research is just how much sea level rise was there at the Pliocene? And is that something we could expect um, under temperatures comparable to what we'll see later in the century? Uh, as I said, a lot of the Antarctic ice sheet, especially in the West, is grounded below sea level. So all the areas that aren't green in the left-hand plot are areas where the bed 
is below sea level and, and hence uh, potentially vulnerable to warming ocean water. Uh, the plot on the right shows a schematic where in the Southern Ocean, the uh, warmest water is typically not at the surface, but at the subsurface uh, because it's, it's more saline and dense than the, than the cooler water at the surface. And so if you have war relatively warm circumpolar deep water that has access to an ice shelf cavity and is able to get into the cavity, um, it can warm the, the, bed, the base of the ice shelf and start melting. Um, and then after that, the um, geometry of the seafloor is very important because if the slope is like shown on the right, where you have uh, the seabed going down as you go um, into the ice sheet interior, uh, then the dynamics of ice sheet are such that the ice sheet gets thicker at its margin as it retreats. Um, and, and if it's thicker, it flows faster. If it flows faster, it thins. If it thins, then the margin is even thicker ice and faster ice, and you have the potential for unstable retreat that would continue uh, potentially tens to hundreds of kilometers in the interior until the, the sea slope um, is in the other direction again. Um, a lot of the West Antarctic ice sheet has a geometric configuration that looks like the schematic. So the worry is that once you start this process in motion, um, it may not be something that would stop even if you were able to remove the forcing. Uh, and that's known as the marine ice sheet instability or, or, or MISI. Uh, there's been a lot of publicity in recent years about other mechanisms for fast ice sheet retreat that might, might, even, might work even more quickly than, than MISI. So MISI typically is relatively slow. It might um, remove a lot of ice in a time scale of several centuries. Um, the Kanto and Pollard a few years ago in a, a well-known paper suggested that a, another set of processes, um, hydrofracture, meaning that you have warm meltwater on the surface of an ice shelf that, that makes crevasses and can make the shelf unstable. Hydrofracture combined with um, another mechanism they propose called the marine ice cliff instability uh, could lead to fast sea level rise um, such that you would have potentially something of the order of a meter from Antarctica in the next century and maybe five meters from Antarctica over the next several centuries. Um, however, um, Mickey as a mechanism is not at all well understood and it's not something that's observed on any, any large scale. So a lot of people have said, well, th this is, it's premature to suggest that a mechanism like this is going to be at work when we don't understand it very well theoretically, and it's not something that we currently observe. Um, so I tend to be skeptical about it, uh, but it is something that people are um, trying to build more complete models of and understand if it's a real threat um, to accelerate ice sheet retreat uh, beyond what we think will happen um, with, with just the marine ice ice sheet instability in effect. So now I wanted to say a bit about ice sheets and CSM. Um, Earth system models for many years um, didn't have dynamic ice sheets and ice sheets were just treated as basically big, bright, stable rocks and models. And this was partly because it was thought that ice sheets weren't going to respond very quickly to warming and partly because it's just incredibly complicated to put ice sheets in a climate model in such a way that the boundaries between land and ice and ocean are all changing around. But with observations earlier in the century that suggested that ice sheets are actually pretty dynamic and can change quickly, um, CSM and other modeling groups started modifying their models to include ice sheets. Um, and this was part of a general broadening of the focus of climate models uh, toward what we now call earth system models that include different aspects Aspects of the biosphere and chemistry and, and so on. So in CSM, we decided that the most efficient way to do this uh, was to have the land model, uh, CLM or now CTSM, compute the surface mass balance of the ice sheet, meaning the, the snowfall on the, and the later melting of the ice sheet. Um, because CL, C, CLM has more sophisticated snow physics and communicates regularly with the atmosphere. So the surface mass balance was computed by CLM and then remapped by the coupler to the community ice sheet model in an earlier version than we have now. Um, in that earlier version, we just assumed simplified shallow ice dynamics and only one way coupling between the land and the ice sheet model. So the ice sheet model could respond to changes in surface mass balance, but changes in the ice sheet geometry didn't feed back on the rest of the climate. Uh, 
So for CSM2, which came out in 2018, uh, a couple of our goals were to make the ice sheet dynamics more realistic and also to allow changes in ice sheets to feed back on the rest of the climate. Uh, the plot on the right shows a hierarchy of ice sheet models. And what we usually use now is what's called the depth and graded higher order model, which is a nice compromise in terms of accuracy and computational costs between the expensive full Stokes model and the cheaper shallow approximations. So in CSM2, uh, if you just run CSM2 out of the box, the ice sheets are, are fixed. <clears throat> but if you set the ice sheets to evolve, you can get the Greenland ice sheet to evolve. And as it evolves, it will pass its new geometry back to the land model and the land model will then adjust. Um, you may have heard that the land model has different land units, uh, vegetated, urban, glacier, and so on. And if you have an ice sheet, let's say that's retreating, then you have glaciated land units becoming vegetated, and that's all handled under the hood in the model in a way that conserves water and energy. Uh, so this is a plumbing diagram, just showing the parts of the model the ice sheets communicate with via the coupler. So the, the land model sends uh, surface mass balance in different elevation classes uh, to the ice sheet dynamic model. And the ice sheet dynamic model will send uh, fluxes of um, either icebergs or liquid basal melting to the ocean. Um, and then we don't have a way of changing the atmospheric lower surface topography on the fly during a run as let's say Greenland retreats but we can do that offline. So you can stop the model, reset the atmospheric topography and, and restart it again every, every 10 years or so. So that's what we've done in simulations of, of longer than a, a, um, a few years. So the one of the things we were excited about for CSM two was we had a better Greenland mass balance. Um, there were some improvements in the treatment of snow and fern, which is snow that's in transition between snow and ice, um, better winds, better polar clouds, uh, we do still have for Greenland a significant bias, which is illustrated in the pictures on the left, where because of the relatively coarse one degree model resolution, the topography in the south of Greenland is not well represented. And so we have too much snowfall that instead of being concentrated along the south, um, southeast coast, uh, works its way in the interior and contributes to building up the ice sheet. So that's a bias that we're trying to improve by uh, improved resolution or, or other means. Uh, one of the motivations for making these changes was to participate in something called the Ice Sheet Model Intercomparison Project for CMIP-6 or ISMIP-6, which was the first ice sheet component of, of CMIP. And it had several parts, um, including just analyzing ice sheet relevant fields from all models, uh, but also doing standalone ice sheet model experiments in which the atmosphere and ocean forcing was derived from a whole suite of CMIP uh, global climate models. And also the first stages of experimenting with, with ice sheets inter, um, interacting with the climate, which um, at this point only a few models can do with CSM being one of those models. But when you have the interactive coupling, of course, then you can explore feedbacks. Um, so CSM was the first model to have uh, published papers describing um, uh, runs at relatively high global resolution of of about a degree and an interactive Greenland ice sheet. Uh, we uh, ran the model in different configurations. This is um, the SSP 585 high emission configuration. You can see from the figures on the right that the blue region where you have uh, a negative surface mass balance and melting um, expands enormously as CO2 increases to above a thousand parts per million. And this leads to about hundred millimeters of sea level rise over the course of the 21st century um, in these simulations. However, we did not find a significant feedback effect in the sense that while the AMOC weakens um, in these simulations, whether or not you have an interactive Greenland um, and weakens by about the same amount. So at least at this level of sea level rise, um, the Greenland feedbacks on the ocean are not as big as, as uh, people have, have been concerned about. Uh, we didn't have a couple to Antarctica, but but we did with SISM a lot of standalone experiments with the Antarctic ice sheet. And one thing we found is that uh, the response of Antarctica to warming of, of uh, a few degrees depends a lot on what the ocean forcing is and what the physics parameters are in the ice sheet model. 
So we found sea level rise for Antarctica over the next few centuries of anywhere from up say 150 millimeters to upwards of 1.5 meters. Um, most of the sea level rise is in the regions that are shaded red in the middle panels um, in the Filchnerani ice shelf um, to the upper end and the Ross ice shelf to the lower end. Um, and the region where most ice, shell, ice sheet retreat is happening today um, in the Thwaites and Pine Island glaciers, that region is illustrated on the right. And what we found there is that under relatively modest melting, there's almost no change, but you reach a threshold at about one and a half or two degrees of warming. And then you drive unstable retreat um, through this basin, which is the darker region of the plot. And that adds another meter more of sea level rise. So obviously something we need to do better is, is understand the thresholds for um, instability of the, of the Thwaites Pine Island region or the Amundsen Sea embayment. Uh, so uh, CSM and CISM were just one of many groups that contributed to ISMIP-6. And if you put everything together, you find a fairly consistent picture for Greenland where you have under the high emission scenarios about um, um, 10, 10 centimeters of sea level rise uh, between now and 2100, uh, with uh, most of that being from increased surface melting. For Antarctica, however, the models are all over the place with estimates from waste ranging from anywhere to ver just very small to uh, about 20 centimeters or, or 200 millimeters of sea level rise by 2100. And then East Antarctica being all, all over the place because in some models, snowfall increases enough in East Antarctica um, to balance most of the melting. And in some cases to balance most of the melting in, in the West Antarctica as well. So in that you have projections of anywhere from almost zero to several tens of centimeters of sea level rise. So this is obviously a place that the models need to, need to do better to make meaningful sea level projections. Um, if you look at the bottom line sea level numbers for AR6, shown in the um, yellow, yellow box, uh, for high emission scenarios, you're looking at about 60 to 100 centimeters of sea level rise from all sources, including land, ice, and ocean thermal expansion. Uh, but with some big caveats about uh, those numbers being, um, could be significantly different if there were Antarctic ice sheet collapse. Uh, so, uh, in the last few minutes, I'd just like to talk about some more recent work that's been done during the model. Uh, this is work by Aaliyah Summers et al. Aaliyah was a postdoc here a couple of years ago. Um, we did simulations of the last interglacial period from 127,000 to about 119,000 years ago. And we, we did asynchronous coupling of the ice sheet um, and so that we could afford to run an 8,000 year simulation CSM. Um, and as you can see, starting from an ice sheet that's close to present day, um, you lose about half of it by about 121,000 years ago. And at that point, the orbital conditions are such that you no longer have as much melting and the ice sheet slowly recovers. Um, a key finding of these simulations is that it depends a lot what the vegetation does. If you don't have interactive vegetation, then the albedos and, and local climate of Greenland and upstream in Canada are not as warm and you don't have nearly as much ice sheet retreat. So this po points to the importance of having dynamic vegetation uh, as part of the whole picture of what ice sheets are doing during, during warm periods. Uh, we also simulated the ice sheet inception that occurred around 116,000 years ago <clears throat> as we were coming out of the last interglacial. And encouragingly, CSM is, with, is able to predict uh, with pretty good accuracy where ice is likely to form as the climate cools. So in particular, um, in the Canadian archipelago and around the margins of Greenland, uh, probably too much ice in Siberia, which is a common problem in, in models that are trying to simulate um, inception. Uh, interestingly, we found <clears throat> not enough simulation, not enough ice forming in Scandinavia where it's known that there was a, a small ice sheet <clears throat> but it turns out that closing ocean gateways in the Canadian archipelago and redistributing the ocean circulation changes the regional climate enough that you actually do start growing ice in Scandinavia as the paleo climate record suggests did happen. Um, moving up in time some more, going to the last glacial maximum about 21,000 years ago, you had a huge ice sheet covering what's now Canada and the Northern US. And uh, this was the these were the first experiments to use a new model of subglacial hydrology that, that we developed. And an interesting thing here is that you have paleo records showing where there were ice streams 
21,000 years ago in this huge ice ice sheet. And so, of course, you wonder, does your model just generate those or as as observed or, or, or not? And actually, the model does pretty well at putting ice streams where we think there were ice streams. Um, these are the, the fast flowing blue regions in the plot on the left. <clears throat> and interestingly, the ice, sheen, ice sheets form in different parts of the ice sheet for different reasons. Uh, some combination of the subglacial hydrology that makes the, the ice flow faster because there's water there making the, making the bed more slippery, um, or steep topography, or the southern margin, uh, weak basal till that allows the ice front to advance into what's now the northern US. Uh, we're also beginning to explore uh, more of the effects of changing ice sheets on the rest of the Earth's climate. Um, this was a set of simulations uh, done recently where using a, a high ice sheet retreat scenario, the meltwater from the ice sheet was put in the Southern Ocean and then see what happens. And what happens is you have a lot more Southern Ocean sea ice with the main mechanism being that the meltwater um, not only is fresh, but is cooler and, and traps more warm water uh, below the surface and allows sea ice to expand more. And it also um, reduces the weakening of the AMOC, the overturning circulation, which is otherwise seen in the simulation. Um, all right, there's supposed to be a plot in the middle showing Greenland, but the bottom line is uh, when you continue a high emission scenario with quadruple CO2 um, and just keep it going out for multiple centuries, you find that you lose the entire ice sheet in about 1700 years. You have retreat initially in the Southwest and then expanding to the North. And then you have feedbacks involving albedo and turbulent fluxes that speed up the process. So at a certain point, you do reach a point of, of no return and where the Greenland ice sheet um, uh, is inevitably gonna be lost in a period of, you lose most of it in the first thousand years or so. Uh, but the good news is if in the case of Greenland, if you were able to lower the temperatures, uh, most of the ice sheet does grow back um, until you get to a point where most of the ice sheet is, is gone. Ah, there it is. Well, I'll move along. Um, uh, another new initiative is to not just simulate ice sheets, but also to simulate mountain glaciers. Uh, we have an ice sheet model, which we've just recently started using as a model for glaciers as well. Um, the physics is fundamentally the same, whether, the, whether you have an entire ice sheet or a smaller complex of glaciers. Um, the main challenge is just in the sheer number of glaciers and the fact that they're much smaller and need to be resolved with much higher resolution. So our typical grid resolution for ice sheets is around four around a four four kilometer grid, but for glaciers we need around a 100 meter grid. So uh, a many times increase in computational cost per unit area. But fortunately, the area of, of mountain glaciers is not that big compared to ice sheets. So it does look like it's going to be computationally feasible to simulate large numbers of glaciers. So the plots shown here are first up. Uh, pilot case where we're just looking at glaciers in the Nepal Himalayas, this being the Everest region. And we, uh, by doing some tuning to make the surface mass balance of glaciers uh, kind of consistent with observations, we can simulate glacier thickness and glacier speeds that are in, in good agreement with observations. And a related project, uh, you may have heard earlier in the week about ves variable resolution CSM where with the spectral element dynamical core of the atmosphere, we can selectively refine regions. So one of the selectively refined regions is the grid shown on the left, uh, where you have refinement of uh, as fine as seven kilometers over high mountain Asia. And one of the uh, goals of these simulations is to accurately simulate the surface mass balance of glaciers so as to predict how the surface mass balance will change in the future. Um, at present, the surface mass balance is still more negative than observed. And so we're trying to kind of sort out what are the scale dependent things in the model that may need to be changed in order to have a more accurate surface mass balance simulation. And also we are now supporting coupling interactively with Antarctica. Uh, this involves having <clears throat> an ocean model, MOM6, the new ocean component that will circulate under ice sheets and can change its shape uh, the, the, chain, the shape of the ice ocean boundary can change as the ice sheet melts. And we now have most of the 
technical software coupling parts in the model to do this, and, and we're just beginning to test the coupling. So for CSM3, we want to support interactive coupling, not just with Greenland as in CSM2, but also with Antarctica and also with paleo ice sheets, which uh, we now have the technical ability to do on developmental branches and are just starting to test and make sure that it all works. And also in CSM3, you'll be able to run with as many ice sheet domains as you'd like at one time. Typically, this would be Antarctica and Greenland or Antarctica and a Northern Hemisphere paleo ice sheet. And as I said, we're also planning to get into the realm of mountain glacier studies and contribute to a project called Glacier MIP, which is like ISMIP, ISMIP 6, but for, but for the world's glaciers. And <clears throat> there's always model development to do. Uh, for SISM, there's a number of physical components we're trying to improve. Um, subglacial hydrology, which is illustrated on the right, where you have uh, basal water flow um, down the hydraulic gradient of Antarctica, uh, better models of calving and, and sub-ice shell melting, and uh, some tests of the hydrofracture cliff collapse mechanism I, I mentioned. Uh, also, a, a major task that we're, we're now seeking financial support to do is to couple CSM to a solid earth and sea level model. So you can, can include feedback such as, for example, as an ice sheet loses mass, um, the load on the earth is less and so the earth can rebound and that's a, um, a potential negative feedback on ice retreat as is the self-gravity um, effect that I mentioned earlier. And uh, the paleo folks are very interested in having water isotopes in the model so that we can track, for example, Delta O18 uh, through, the, through the earth system through the centuries. And land ice, of course, is an important part of that. Um, so just to summarize, uh, CSM is pretty far along compared to other Earth system models in um, having interactive ice sheets. And we're now able to do the kinds of experiments uh, that no one was able to do with the global Earth system model um, until very recently. And that's very exciting. And if any of you are interested in being part of these experiments, of course, let us know and we'd be glad to, to help you get started. Um, the coupling to the ocean is still much harder and must, much less advanced than the coupling of the land and atmosphere. And the biggest problem for people concerned about sea level rise in the next few decades and centuries is, is how do we model ice ocean interactions around Antarctica and put better constraints on the Antarctic contribution to sea level. And uh, scientifically, uh, I would say that uh, sea level rise, well, obviously sea level will keep going up. It does seem unlikely that sea level rise would be greater than one meter in this century. Although uh, for ice sheets, this is an exoral process and we're now entering a temperature range between one and two degrees where you have the potential of triggering larger changes in ice sheet that could eventually lead to sea level rise of several meters or more that may not be reversible. So that's still, of course, a, a major concern as we consider, for example, what trajectory we're going to be on, how close we'll come to the 1.5 degree Paris target, or, or do we shoot past 1.5 to 2 degrees? And for ice sheets, it potentially makes a major difference whether you stop at 1.5 or, or go on to 2 or more. So uh, with that, I'll wrap up. Um, we're very glad to work with anybody who's interested in ice sheets. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Land Ice Working Group, along with Mirren Viscano, um, who's at Delft in the Netherlands, and our liaisons are Gunter Legge and Kate Thayer Calder, who are not able to be here today, but um, who are extremely helpful in helping people work with the model. Uh, and of course, we have a winter meeting like all the other working groups, and we'd love to see you either virtually or in person at our next winter meeting. So thanks. So thank you, Bill. That was uh, really insightful. When you think your model needs to have high resolution, 100 meters is really that's really high. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, it's fabulous looking at what's happening with the mountain glaciers as well as all the ice sheet work. So we have about five minutes for um, questions. If people want to come to the microphones and uh, address your question to Bill, that'd be great. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoy it. Um, so the question I have is. So you mentioned that in Paleocene period, the sea level, sea level is five to 20 meters above mm -hmm. compared to present day. I was wondering just out of curiosity because um, your ice model is kind of interact with land 
avocado, but the ocean grid cell is kind of fixed. So how will that affect our confidence about the paleoclimate simulations? So, sorry, when you say the ocean grid cell, you mean the ocean horizontal grid? Yeah. Uh, like because the, the land ocean boundary is fixed, you mean? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a knotty problem in terms of getting all the pieces to work together. Um, now, the, <clears throat> one of the great things about MOM is that unlike POP, the older ocean model, um, MOM keeps track of the actual mass of the ocean. And you can have ocean grid cells that have zero mass or, or any finite amount of mass. So with the ocean model, if you put more mass in the ocean, you actually will have ice moving up on shore so that uh, grid cells that were dry are now wet. So <clears throat> in that way, it's not a problem for MOM6 because the model was designed to accommodate changes like that. Uh, what's trickier, I think, is um, the land model and the coupling assume that if a grid cell is land once, it's land always. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you have an ice shelf that's advancing, then as the ice shelf advances, it needs a surface mass balance, which comes from the land model. And the land model, as it's presently configured, has no way of knowing that an ice shelf has moved forward and, and now it needs a surface mass balance. So that's something we're hoping to work on in the next year or so to, to enable that. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. I guess just following up on that, uh, we were talking about how do we get the mass from uh, land ice into the sea ice when you carve, uh, so through the oceans. Mm -hmm. And we were sort of saying, well, there's this snow capping parameterization that means we have a runoff of ice to the ocean, which freshens the ocean, and then that can refreeze the sea ice, but we don't really have this mechanism for, for carving of icebergs and things like that. So mm -hmm. that would be an, another element of research, right? Yeah. Hi, great talk. Um, I just had a question what the current efforts are about the deglacial evolution of the glaciers and uh, cism and sort of especially characterizing like the millennial scale, like Heinrich stadials and younger dry ice events where you have the sort of these ice calving and potentially AMOC disruption events. Because I know currently that's not very well characterized. In, in the um, so, so what do we plan to do about that in the model? Well, well right now, I'm working with Zhang and others um, on a proposal which would include um, expanding C <clears throat> CESM capability so that we could tribute, um, can simulate, for example, Heinrich events uh, and put our allow armadas of, of icebergs to go into the ocean and move around and freshen the ocean. And we're, we don't right now have the support to do that, um, but we're searching for the support to do that. And, and with the resources, um, that is that is high on our list. Thank you. And yeah, that was sort of part of what Dave Bailey came up with well, yesterday in the discussion as well. It was great, like Which talking was? about the sea ice, land ice yeah. coupling. Yeah. Hi, thanks for that talk. Um, that uh, long-term simulation you did for the last interglacial, have mm -hmm. you done something similar looking at the Antarctic ice shelf and have you observed any like East Antarctic melting in those scenarios? Because I'm just thinking like the Pliocene is an equilibrated climate state. So. You mean like a, a multi-thousand year simulation yes. with Antarctica? Mm -hmm. um, not with CSM. We we can we can do multi-thousand year simulations with a stand with a standalone SISM, standalone ice sheet model. Um, and we do have a project ongoing where we're going to where we're planning to do sort of partly coupled simulations involving the Antarctic ice sheet and um, ocean forcing associated with the last interglacial. So sometime in the next one or two years, those simulations should come out. And so you'll have an ocean run that's been, say, it's been spun up or, or um, advanced with orbital and CO and greenhouse conditions corresponding to the last interglacial. And we're trying to understand um, how Antarctica advances under that changed forcing, because we think that waste collapsed and lost several meters of sea level during the last interglacial. Um, and so I guess that would be a step on the way to what you're talking about, where you have, I think what you're talking about, where you have fully coupled CSM looking at Antarctica on those timescales. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, I guess we, we haven't done it, but we're obviously interested in, in you know, taking steps toward that. Okay. Is that something you're interested in working on? Yeah, well, I'm particularly interested in Pliocene climate ah, okay. and comparing that to future, future yeah. um, climate change projections. Yeah. And I'm just thinking like 
if you have if you're only running these future um, SSP scenarios until 2100, then maybe you don't you're just not giving it enough time to observe East Antarctic changes, perhaps. Yeah, for for sure. Okay. <clears throat> and what, one of the things we're interested in is, in, in general, Antarctica is not. <clears throat> you have to push Antarctica pretty hard in terms of the ocean warming in order to get the, the ice sheet to lose many meters of, of sea level equivalent. And that might be because our ice sheet model is, is too simple and lacking sensitivity in the physics, or it might be because we're missing coupled earth mechanisms. And one of the coupled earth mechanisms we're missing is uh, if you have, let's say, a massive degla deglaciation in the Northern hemisphere, which is very quick, then you can, uh, raise sea level around Antarctica a lot. And if the I, if you do this on a time scale that's shorter than glacial rebound, then that makes it even harder for Antarctica to adjust. So you have the possibility of Antarctic collapse being triggered by what's going on in the Northern Hemisphere and the rate at which that's happening. So you have a combination of external sea level rise from the Northern Hemisphere and, and potentially local ocean warming and atmospheric warming and changes in winds all going on at the same time. And, and <clears throat> very challenging to untangle all those, but, but, but very interesting to work on. So, so maybe we should talk afterward. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, thank you. So um, Bill, one of the things that Gokhan and um, Gustavo both brought up is with MOM, you can mm -hmm. now get uh, war warming and melting below the ice shelves. Yeah. And uh, that seems to be a, a, you know, a process that wasn't previously available. Yeah. And so that's a really another nice coupling between the yeah. ocean and the, the land ice. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and there the, the big challenge is, is scale, <clears throat> where if you have a big ice shelf like Ross or Filchnerani, you can resolve that pretty well at, at say one degree. But if you have a smaller ice shelf like Pine Island or Thwaites, where a lot of stuff is happening, you don't resolve that so well. And may, maybe you don't get the heat in the right place. You get too much heat or too little heat, but, or for the wrong reason. Um, and so then you have to look at nested models and more clever parameterizations. Fabulous, thank you so much. Um, just thank Bill once more. Thank you.